Hey, everybody. That is Gary Smith. That is Kaz Kenny. And I am Eddie Bramble, and this is episode 13 of the Blackwood Events Podcast. Kaz, why don't you start us off with this week's fishing report? Uh, well, let's, let's keep it real this week. Uh, it's been tough. You know, temperature's been up. Temperature's been down. We had two inches of rain. It was chocolate mud day before yesterday. Chocolate mud still yesterday. Water's up flood tide levels, so if there are any fish, they can go wherever the hell they want. So they're hard <laughs> to find right now. And, I mean, I talked to three guys yesterday out. Um Nothing. I talked to Wayne. Wayne had, uh, I think he said, a catfish and two crappy. But he also went to one of the crappy spots to see if we had any crappy, and weren't no crappy. So uh, a lot of snakeheads rolling, he said, but they couldn't get anything to bite over there. That's what it sounds like everywhere. The snakeheads are breathing, they're getting air, but nobody's catching anything, and nobody, just not seeing anything caught. So uh, I did hear of a couple yellow perch over in the Chick, um, above Drawbridge, in between Drawbridge and Newbridge. I talked to Justin uh, the day be- or yesterday. I talked to Justin, and he said that they had uh, he pulled one of the nets over there in Blackwater, and he said he had a jag of snakeheads in there. He said he had a couple carp, a couple um, shad, and only had two white perch in the net. And we were talking about last year. By this time, by this time last year, he already had quite a few thousand pounds of white perch mm. at Key Wallace. Good grief. So that's not looking good. But anyway, that's what we've been seeing in the refuge. Um, up to the north, I'm hearing the yellow perch are still biting. Blue cats are still getting them in Susquehanna. Um, here in the warm water discharge of peach bottoms, up and down. You know, some days we're getting some good fish, some big smallmouth. I heard of a couple muskies being caught up there here recently. So uh, trying to get some pictures of those. Uh, Justin still told me last week, he said, as soon as he's got one of them big giants, he's going to put it in our hands so that we can bring it here and put it on a tape and put it, you know, put so it people scale. can see it. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I mean, that's kind of where the fishing's all at. I know corn flour over there in the Marshy Hope and over there in Anacoke, they're getting some big blue cats still. You know, he's taking people out just about every day, so he's staying pretty busy. Um, haven't heard much from any of the other guides here locally, uh, but who I have talked to, it's it's been just a junk fest the last couple of days. So, cross your fingers. We get some warm temperatures. Uh, yesterday, water temperature was in the mid-40s. That's what I saw out there. I was hoping the sun would come out and get us some – didn't ever materialize. We had clouds all day. I think that's why we never saw a bite yesterday. Everybody I've talked to so far today, nothing going on. So that's where we are at the fishing. Uh, we need some warm weather and some sun. Sun, sun, sun. That's what we need sun. Definitely need some sun. Sun, hey, sun. sun, always, sun always helps <laughs> to bring these snakehead up. <laughs> so this week we've got Chef Chad Wells here. And Chad's not in studio with us. He's on the phone there. So Chad, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background here. Hey, guys. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm just uh, just a guy. No, <laughs> I'm just a uh, <laughs> You know, I'm I'm a chef that has has um, spent some time, uh, quite a bit of time dealing with snakeheads. Um, I was the uh, the first in the um, the first in the the area to, to the first in the country to serve a snakehead that was caught locally in the area. At the time, it wasn't legal to uh, have a commercial market, and um, I spent some time around some people that helped get that law changed, so that way we could try to take uh, take a bite out of it, uh, so to speak. Um, and you know, here we are, uh, I'm just a guy that a lot of people come to for advice. I've been dealing with snakehead, uh, cooking snakeheads since 2009. Uh, I've been cooking them in restaurants since 2010, been fishing for them since 2008. So, so how exactly did you get into snakehead fishing? What, what was the draw for you when you first, when you first saw these fish? Um, you know, I, I bass fish and I've always bass fish, bass fished. Um, and you know, it was kind of one of those things where, uh, there was something new and, you know, I spent the first, I'll say two years, very unsuccessful. Uh, you know, you'd hook one, not land it. Um, uh, we were, we were doing a lot of kayak fishing in the Potomac and it just became kind of like an obsession to me, uh, to try to get one. And at the time, you know, you'd hear every once in a while, there'd be like a bass tournament. So somebody would bring one in and everybody's like, Oh, what is that thing? You know? And, and so I put a, a lot of effort into it. And then finally, um, I got to go on an electroshock trip with DNR in 2009 um, out in the Potomac, and we went in some of the creeks, and it was it was amazing because at the time it was very early uh, in their uh, their presence in a Potomac. So going out on the electro boat, I got to learn a lot about you know where the fish hide, what their habits are, and then after that, just start catching them like wildfire. Um, you know the population grew, but I had a little bit of an inside track on on a little bit about their their habits and how they feed uh, and things of that nature. So it, it became became easier to catch them. Um, and then from there forward, um, you know it's just kind of been a passion project of mine. Um, you know I've always been a very environmentally conscious and aware. Uh, and you know, I, I use a lot of that. I take a lot of that into the kitchen with me and, uh, 
you know, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it. The rest is history. And, and you know, got to meet a lot of cool people through through a community uh, that was created just by fishing for these things and the uh, the the curiosity that a lot of people had back then. I mean, Chad, you, you've 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 had a lot of of I don't know if, uh, how I want to word it like commercial exposure. I mean, we've seen you on TV, we've seen you in magazines, we've seen you all over the place in the media. As far as that goes, um, you're you're pretty influential, you know. As far as you know, this whole snakehead thing goes, and I think a lot of guys reach out to you. So why don't you tell us about um, some 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 of the, the the great experience you've got to to have, you know, in your chef career. As far as like your visit with Guy Fieri and the snakeheads there at the Alewife, you know what I mean? Yeah, so that that was crazy, man. It it was um I always say to people, man, I'm I'm just a chef and this is only food. You know, the, <laughs> the fishing is what was more important to me. And it, it was really interesting because, you know, when we when we started doing this, me and a guy who worked for DNR, and it's a program that DNR no longer has. Um, but you know, th- he had a seafood outreach and marketing thing where they were kind of connecting local watermen with um local watermen in restaurants and that was kind of like so everybody could know their source and things of that nature um when i started talking about how i wanted to do snakeheads he's the one who got me linked up with the electro trip and we got a bunch and that was the first time we were legally allowed to sell them in a restaurant so i put on facebook one day that i was going to set that i was cooking snakeheads and my you know i had two buddies there who were both heavily involved at the time with with trying to get these snakeheads commercialized and um it, it was insane, man. It, it was like a, a lightning suddenly struck and every media outlet on the planet got in touch with me. Um, you know, I had uh, I, I was on a news station in you know northern Canada. I had people from Alaska reaching out to me uh, basically because at the time everybody thought these were like the fish that were going to like eat your children and kill your dog. And they're so crazy looking. And it, it was just very strange because, you know, as somebody who just who who came up, you know, just kind of being like a a punk rock guy who spends a lot of time on the water and a lot of time in the kitchen, it was just crazy to have all these people reaching out. And I had a, there was a small Food Network show called uh, Hook Line and Dinner, and they reached out to me and they said, "Hey, we have a show about fishing and cooking. We have we have to have you for this." So they came down, and of course, it's in like February. And they wanted to try to get a snakehead. And, and we had to try to make it look like it was summer. Um, fortunately, I had some that I had frozen that I caught. And uh, we went out and we fished for two days in a freezing cold. Uh, we went to like some old ponds that were up in um, up near like Fort Washington. We went to all these places that were all the usual haunts at the time that would produce. And we didn't even get a bite. I mean, it was like it was impossible. But the cool thing was is that I had them there. We went and we did this. And the second that show aired, man, it went nuts. I had, um, I was on bizarre foods, uh, bizarre foods, America, uh, for their Washington DC, um, edition. Uh, I was on diners, drive-ins and dives. Um, and it was weird. They originally wanted me to do triple D earlier, but because I was on bizarre foods, they were like, we have to space it out. We can't do them so close together. Um, I was on that. I had to do, I did a bunch of stuff for MPT, um, I did a couple, uh, a couple like outdoor life magazine, um, a bunch of things like that. But I mean, it was literally, it, it was nuts. And then every summer after that would roll around, I was getting like thousands of people from all over the country reaching out to me about like, Hey, how do I cook snakeheads? Hey, I'm coming on vacation. I'm going to be in Maryland. Where can I catch one? Can I come to your restaurant and eat one? It literally got to a point where, uh, I, I, I thought to myself like, like, holy crap, this is actually going to happen. Like the, the, this market is going to explode. You know, we're going to be taking the last bite. We're going to have this thing under control. It, it went the other direction. Um, it got to a point where I was buying so many snakeheads. There was me and two other places that were, those places were in D.C. and I was in Baltimore. And we were buying so many, nobody could get them. Um, I had bought so many at Alewife at one point that the price doubled. Because wow. the only ones that were available, people knew that I wanted them. A place in D.C. wanted it. And that was kind of the opposite of what we wanted to happen. Um, right. But... It was it, it was just it, it's very hard to describe and you know I was very fortunate because it, it it brought me a lot of success that I would have never otherwise had you know there's there's hundreds of chefs way way better ones than me you know that that never get a word mentioned about them and for me you know being able to do something I was passionate about which is the whole invasive or thing you know I was I've always served blue catfish I serve you know feral hogs and things of that nature I'd always done that and that was something that was very important to me. 
but it was like the snakehead suddenly became like the sexy poster child for <laughs> eating for eating invasive species. And you know, so now I love to get the opportunity with all these new people that I've never met before to talk about cooking. I love the fact that, you know, I've got to be in a bunch of books. Every chef wants their stuff, you know, published and and you know, books that you can buy all around the globe and people like to see themselves on TV. It's something that I can be proud of, but I did it by doing something that's positive for the ecosystem. So that's I was very very fortunate to be put into a situation just for having a belief system. Mm. Ted, where did you first uh, try snakehead? Did you, did you cook them yourself or did you eat them somewhere else? Ate them, we did it ourselves. The first one I ever took a bite out of was me. I'm just not mentioning his name because I don't know where he stands. Actually, yeah, I will. Me and my buddy Steve, um, <laughs> <laughs> he's the one who worked for uh, DNR. Uh, me and him, the first one that we got, we got it off that electroshock boat. Uh, we brought it back to the restaurant. Uh, actually, this is really interesting. That snakehead with DNR, we stabbed it in the head, and somehow that thing did not die. Oh, wow. And um, <clears throat> we didn't realize it didn't die until we're walking off the boat, and the thing popped out of the cooler. <laughs> so <laughs> that's 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 the day we learned the, uh, the importance of cutting the gill plates. So, like, right when we get off the boat, we cut the gill plates out. We take it down to um, – we take it down to uh, – to the restaurant and the first bite i ever had was was raw it was uh we ate it raw wow we figured that was the best way to do it so we tasted it we ate it raw not the smartest thing in the world but you know what you gotta you gotta kind of know what it tastes like to know what you're gonna do with it and then we took this these small fillets the fish was only maybe like six pounds um we took it we we fried it grilled it boiled it tried to make the skin taste good unsuccessfully i've never been able to do that um <clears throat> and you know then we were from there we were good to go So, so when when you're cooking these fish, what what's what do you think is the best size imaginable for for handling as far as filleting and cooking? What what's the optimal size for you? I think the smaller the better. Um, the ones that are really large, um, obviously there's a lot more you can do with a bigger fillet. Um, the smaller ones, I think a you get a better yield off of them because their head is not giant, and you do lose a lot when you have like a, a fish with a giant head, unless you're going to boil them and make stocks or do something like that. And that's not for everybody. Um, but I like smaller fish, fish in like the three to four pound range. Okay. I think are, are really good to eat. They're really good to fillet. Um, you get you get the most out of them. Um, and I also think the meat actually tastes better when the fish is a little smaller. And that and that goes kind of across the board with a lot of a lot of different fish. Hey guys, I gotta plug something in. Give me one second. Okay. I'm sorry. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's our that's our theme music. <laughs> Your call will be answered in 24 minutes. <laughs> Please hold. We have now extended your time to 45 minutes. <laughs> there are plenty of good recipes, though. There are. And we're going to get into that. So, I, think, I, want to, I want to make sure we get into the tournaments and the mm-hmm. other stuff like that with him, too. Oh, while Chad's plugging in whatever he needs to plug in, um, this is a good time to mention he's actually going to be at the Snakehead Festival. Oh, yeah. So go yeah. ahead. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that before Chad gets back on the radio with us. So the Snakehead Festival, April 4th, out here at Sailwinds Park yep. in Cambridge, Maryland. Man, we are selling boosts like crazy. I mean, we're gaining steam, and it's coming in quick. So, uh, yeah, we're going to have Chad Wells out there. He'll be on stage. We're going to talk about preparation, how to, how to prepare, you know, how to bring it from the water to your house to the dinner table. And he's going to do some demonstrations, and he's going to share some of his recipes He's also going to put together a little kind of cookbook to give to the public. You know, working so on it. Working on that. So hopefully we'll have that by then too. Not sure if it's going to be ready. We by will the or not, but we're trying. We will. So he just said we will. You back, Chad? Yeah, man. Sorry, we were about to end in a very abrupt way. If I didn't <laughs> no plug my, uh, my laptop. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Chad, so, question for you: Have uh, Have you ever tried the uh, snakehead row? Yeah. Um. Actually, when we were filming Bizarre Foods. Uh, that was the first time I had had it. And what we did is we just literally took the roe, salted it, uh, salted it and ate it, ate it raw, fried it, um, fried it. And it was really good. Uh, there was a lot that we did with Andrew Zimmern that was not not aired. Um, that that was that was a really cool uh, experience because he's a an awesome guy. But B, we weren't we weren't making a show about the restaurant. We were actually doing a show about the culture surrounding snakeheads. Uh, I went out and went bow fishing with uh, the guys that were with a bunch of guys that I that I have been fishing with forever, 
<coughs> went bow fishing with them and those guys are they're just monsters i didn't even want to try i suck at bow fishing <laughs> um but um so what i i cooked sandwiches on the boat and then we did a little segment at alewife that was we filmed there that was just about cooking but when we filmed that we did a lot like andrew zamern's a wild man he'll eat anything <laughs> yeah, so you know so. we we tried all kinds of different different things and i mean even he, even him i gave him the skin and he said it was disgusting Sure. There's just nothing you can do with that skin to make it taste good. I'm convinced of it. <laughs> I'll take your word I've, for it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, yeah. I tried to make the skin into bacon. I took it, cured it. I did a wet brine, then a dry brine, cured it, smoked it, and then tried to eat it, and it still tasted like a dog's ass. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had a dog's Lou ass. Ask how you <laughs> <know> that. <laughs> That's enough to make me run the other way. I'll tell you that. <laughs> no, yeah, I've, like, I've ate the roe a couple of times. I really, I think it's particularly good. It, it it's very good. It's just uh, honestly, I I feel like most fish roe that, that's edible is good, and and I snakehead's no different. Um, I I like to take the roe and and uh, do a little bit of a uh, seasoned flour. And just do it in a saute pan or a cast iron pan and just get a little bit of texture on it. I think it's absolutely delicious. Huh. That sounds pretty good. So when you when you when you ate it raw, uh you it sounds to me like you didn't really like it like it raw. No, I I like it. I like it raw. I you like did. all all fish raw. Um I just think that uh, when you're dealing with with fish that are from some of these waters, raw is probably not the smartest uh, way to go. Oh, okay, I gotcha. Um, I gotcha. Okay. That's what I was trying you to know, figure out. I, I was under the influence when you were saying in the beginning about you tasted it, you tried it raw, you know, maybe you weren't that impressed. So you are impressed. So yeah, how, oh, I thought so it was how do you delicious. get rid of worms? <laughs> <laughs> Cook them. <laughs> yeah, right, there you go. <laughs> so w what did you fix when you were on, on the two TV shows? What did you fix for Andrew and what did you fix for uh, for Guy? All right, so the, the first show is on with Hook, Line, and Dinner. We made tacos. And – if you look all over, um, you can find it still on some websites. There's a recipe for it. If you ever see a recipe that says Frankenfish Tacos, that was from Cooking Channel or FoodNetwork.com. Uh, if you could scroll to the bottom, it shows my name. I, I, that's my recipe. That was the first thing we did because I felt that tacos are super approachable. They're easy to make at home. Uh, the recipe was not hard, and it's something that kind of gives you a baseline where you can have fun on your own because everybody likes tacos, and you can do whatever you want. The second reason I did that is because the yield is very poor on snakeheads on, uh, from a restaurant standpoint. And when you have a low-yield fish, that, that leads to a high price on the plate. And I didn't want to give something that, mm. that people have never had. The goal was for people to eat it. Um, you know, so the way I looked at it is if I could make something to where I don't need a ton of fish to make it and the price can be a little bit lower, more people are going to have it. So I did that taco. And a taco is something I still see to this day all over the snakeheadlife.com oh, yeah. and the recipes page. Everybody makes tacos because it's simple. You can also fry, grill, or saute and end up with a good result with tacos. Um, and, so and what's up? I, and people can always reach out to you if, if they want some help or need a suggestion, right? Oh, absolutely. No question. I mean, I get it all the time. And, and you know, sometimes it might take me some time to get back to people, but I always do. And, uh, you know, I'm always happy to do that. Uh, the second thing that I did was um, was Bizarre Foods. I made like a blackened snakehead sandwich on the boat. Um, we were very limited with what we could cook. We had a grill on, uh, I think it was like a pontoon boat type thing. That was set up for bow fishing, and we had just a propane, a small propane grill on there. So what I did is we we caught the we the fish was shot and we filleted it instantly and cooked it. Um, <clears throat> that to this day is still the best tasting snakehead I've ever had. I don't know what was different about it except for the fact that I was starving because we'd been out <laughs> we'd been out since like six o'clock in the evening, and we find that we finally the the weather was so bad um, you couldn't see anything. It was it was murky water. Uh, the tides were off. Uh, so we finally started seeing them literally around sunrise the following morning. Oh, wow. um, and once we started seeing them, we saw a lot. Like it was, they, they were on, you know, the switch flipped, fish were on. Um, so that one, um, it's amazing when you can cook a fish and its flesh is still beating when you put it onto the grill. And that's what was the case was with this. Um, you know, so we did, I did like a black and snakehead sandwich that was really simple. Just, uh, I want to say I did some kind of, uh, some kind of like jicama relish or something that I had made in the restaurant and brought with it. And we just ate sandwiches. And, and the point of that show is to show simple, easy, you know, it's kind of telling the story more than it is about cooking the actual food. And it's about food that people see as weird. So you want to do something that's super approachable when you're doing that because you want people to say, oh, man, like this is a an easy, um, 
this is an easy fish to deal with. It's an easy fish to, to eat and you know, it's simple to prepare. So we did that. Then with uh, triple D uh, we actually did not do snakeheads on the show. We just showed them. Um, the reason we couldn't was a, the time of year when they filmed, we were, we were struggling a little bit to get them and B it was something that um, I'd had so much coverage on already. They want to do their own thing. Right. So I had just won. Um, they do this like top 10 best dishes in Baltimore. And I had just, I won number three for uh, these Southwest snakehead cakes. I was doing at Alewife. Yeah. So at the time that was getting this, there was a lot of publicity surrounding that. And they didn't, they didn't want to take something that was already publicized. They wanted to take their, take something that was unknown and blow it up. And, and good God they do. But they so what we ended up doing we did uh this like pork belly mac and cheese fries and then we did wild boar sliders because i i asked them they they said you know hey is there any other invasives that you do and i was also doing something with blue catfish but they were like we really want to show these fish on here luckily a couple days before that show aired um a buddy of mine named todd murphy uh caught the at the time was the world record snakehead um in the potomac or the state record i'm sorry the state record snakehead. So I had that fish because oh, he gave awesome. it to me to cook. So when when we showed it, <laughs> uh, Guy Fieri's price uh, response was priceless when I broke this thing out because he'd never seen one before. And uh, I don't know. I, I don't think they aired it aired when he first saw it. But like he was like, can I take a picture with you and that crazy dragon that's over there? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, man. And I pulled it out of the ice and he was like, oh, God, that's horrible. <laughs> like so, um, but he actually ate, he actually ate it. We cooked it and he ate it too. And he like he said it was awesome. So, uh, I wish we could have got that on the air and dealt more with it, but we did talk, get to talk about it quite a bit. So, but it was cool that the experience of dealing with those shows and having just that opportunity is something that's, it's once in a lifetime. And, and it, it, I'm very, very fortunate to have been in a position to do that. Cause you're, you're a little bit unique in that do you, you're a chef, but you also fish. And you know a lot of I don't think that's probably the case with a lot of chefs that they actually yeah, some true. of some of what they're they're cooking they're actually harvesting. What's the biggest snakehead you caught? Uh, I caught one. I've caught two that that I'm particularly proud of. Um, I got one in the Potomac that was about like a, just a hair under 15 pounds. Um, I caught that one about four years ago uh, out of um, Aquia Creek. Um, <coughs> I caught that. I caught a big one with Kaz too one time. What was yeah. that? Was what twelve pounds or so? Yeah, I think that's a picture we have on the on the up now on you for the podcast. Yep. And then I got I got another one uh, in the Potomac several years back that was uh, that was about thirteen pounds. Um, and then honestly, man, the best one I ever caught was the first one I ever caught because I tried so hard for so long to figure these fish out, and you know, no one knew what to do at that time to catch them besides shoot them with a bow and arrow. And the first one I caught, I caught it on a chatterbait. Uh, it was a chatterbait with a green pumpkin trailer. And um, so for me, that that's the best one I ever caught. And it wasn't. And I don't even want to talk about how big that thing was because it wasn't. <laughs> and, uh, but to me, that's the be- that's the best one I ever caught. Just because you know, I I worked so hard for that fish. And the other ones are, the other ones were fish that just they come by chance. You know, you could do all the everything right and not catch one. And then you can do everything wrong and end up on a happenstance that you just bust into like a 14 pounder and you're like, oh, holy hell, you know? <laughs> so, and then it's about putting all the pieces together and figuring out the puzzle of what you did right and what you did wrong. And now yeah, it's funny because now we all look, I could sit there and say, oh man, I went out and caught like 20 of them. You in, need 2008, in 2008, if I got a bite from one or even saw one, I was the happiest man on the planet. You know, and and now it's like you go out and you're upset when you don't get one. But you know, a day out fishing is always better than a day at work. So I'll take it. And I, I think I think you just hit the nail on the head because I mean we hear time and time again, and me and you can both attest to it because we watch we've watched a lot of people grow now. You know, you and myself over the last couple of years, everybody's watched a lot of people grow. I'm not just saying me and you, but I think the biggest thing that that we hear from people that come here that aren't successful is this. Man, I've been down there six, seven times, man. They're catching them all around me, man, and I just can't catch them. And, and I tell everybody the same thing. You know what? Your day is coming. You just got to put the time mm-hmm. in. Every time you come here, you will learn something from that experience to put forward to your next visit. You know what I mean? And we've watched these guys. I mean, I look at some of the guys on the page a year ago, 
and they were struggling, you know, reaching out to guys like us, you know, Eddie, Gary, me, you, anybody on the administration panel. We've always been, we've always been willing to help anybody out. You know what I mean? And now these guys are coming back and they're successful or let's say 80 to 90% successful most of the time when they come back because they're using the tools they've learned each trip they've come here on their next on their next trip you know what i mean so i I think you're exactly right chad i think that you know a lot of people think i just got to catch one some people do but then we've got guys like me and got you know that 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 work for them you know and we see and we learn the effective tools that we use for the next trip you know what i mean or we we learn we learn from the mistakes that we made the previous trip before the next trip you know what i'm saying there's a you know there's a learning curve for sure oh yeah well beyond that too uh, I think, and I think this was my problem, and I think this is what a lot of people suffer from, and this is something a lot of fishermen do not ever think about. Confidence travels down the line. Absolutely. If you, if you have been I out agree. ten times fishing for snakeheads and you don't catch one, every trip your confidence drops. And if you're not confident, the fish know your presentations aren't right. You know, a lot of things can go wrong and go against you when your confidence isn't there. And for me, and I, and that's not say be o- so overly confident you're arrogant because then you're just an asshole. But, <laughs> you know, with, 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 I think that I completely lost confidence in a, in the first, my first several outings trying to catch one. And then what finally happened is I was fishing actually in a bass tournament with a friend of mine and I just was destroying bass. I, it was one of the best days that I've ever had. One of those one of those days that you just live to tell the story about and you hope that you have grandkids to tell it to. <laughs> it, you know, it was just like I was destroying them. And I was so confident in the bait that I was throwing and the presentation that I was doing and the areas that I was hitting and the pattern that I found. I was so confident. It was just like, bow, snakehead right there. And I was doing the exact same thing. And then later that day, boom, caught another one, caught another one, caught another one. And then all of a sudden, from that point forward, I kind of started piecing a little bit together and said, hey, I think I'm on to something with these. I'm confident in my pattern and presentation, and it's working. You know, and when that happens, all of a sudden, then you start, you know, going into other stuff. And if your confidence starts to fail, you go back to your confidence. That's right. the same thing that you would do in any in any situation. You know, I kept, me and Kaz went out uh, this past spring. Uh, we went out with, with my uncle. And we didn't catch a damn thing. Yeah. And what did I? And, and what did I do, Kaz? I put a, a switch to a chatter bait because that's my most confident bait in catching snakeheads when they're not hitting the top. And I can usually find one on a chatter bait. Now well, I threw that thing relentlessly for over three hours, and we didn't we didn't get a bite. And that's just the day. That's the type of fish day. they are. Yeah. yeah, the first one I ever caught. Six. I was I was uh, I'd fished all day out in the kayak and came in and the tide was up real high and the soybean field was flooded where I put my kayak in. And came in and saw something swirl in the soybeans and caught two. <laughs> yeah, there you go. In the soybeans. Isn't that yeah. awesome? Hey, we catch snakeheads in the soybeans. Yeah. We don't need no lily pads over here. What are you That's talking right. about? So, Chad, I, I'm, I, I got a little thought here, you know, and you, you've been you've been a pretty instrumental guy on the bow fishing scene over there on the Potomac, and I know that, that you have done, you know, your fair share of work with the tournaments and putting some stuff together over there and, Helping to uh, you know gain steam with the bow fishermen and 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 trying to knock numbers down over there. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the uh, bow fishing tournaments that you guys did, and I talk about some of the numbers of the snakeheads that you guys had coming in the weigh-ins off the Potomac. Sure. So just to clarify, you know, I've never been really a bow fisherman. I've gone out a bunch. I've shot some fish. Um, I've missed more than I've hit, uh, and that'll probably stay that way forever because I'm not very good at it. Like I said. Um, However, uh, I have some friends, they, they were doing this thing called Whack Factor Outdoors, and they were putting on this snakehead tournament annually. And I would work with them uh, basically on the food side. So what we would do is, you know, we did a, a division for uh, hook and line. We did a division for uh, bow fishing, and then I would handle all the cooking. And we threw the weigh-in was basically like a giant party. It was called Potomac Snakehead Tournament. We did it for five years. Um, so I don't want to take any credit for being instrumental in the bow fishing thing. I just became very known in that community just because of what was going on with these tournaments. Well, and, um, and I, instrumental, so, what I mean is, 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 is you, you've been, you, you've stood behind everybody that wanted to get on the map, you know, you kind of, you kind of oh, helped absolutely. them, you know what I mean? And so with the, with these tournaments, it ended up, so the first one we did, we had maybe 50 people there. Um, we had a lot of sponsors, um, but the weigh-in, we had maybe a hundred people showed up for the weigh-in to watch it. And, and, you know, at the time we got a good amount of fish in there. Um, I, I want to say the first year we got a couple hundred pounds and we would start, 
Uh, we started the tournament, started at like 6 p.m., and it went until the next day at like noon. Um, because wow. a lot of the bow guys like to fish at night. The hook and line guys like to fish the tides in the evening and the morning. Uh, the hook and line, the first year, I think Big Fish was actually won by hook and line. Um, but the bow fishing guys were getting just crazy numbers. Um, when you say crazy numbers, tell me what crazy numbers are. I mean, they were they were going out at the time. They were going out. Each one of them would come back with, you know, 15 to 15 to 20 fish. Um, the final year that we did it, just to show you uh, how that population increased. And, w- and what was very interesting is we would have, like, you know, somebody from uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife would come and talk. Uh, we would typically have Joe Love would come and show everybody how to dispatch the snakeheads. Um, you know, obviously, we were, we were bringing away – we were doing a weigh-in, so the fish had to be dead. Um, so they would come and do that. And the final year, the bow fishing had blown up so much in the Potomac that you couldn't go out in the evening without running into other people. And most of the fish I was selling at the time were coming from bow fishermen. Uh, I had a commercial guy that did a phenomenal job, um, that would get me just, I could call him and be like, Hey, I need 300 pounds. He'd be like, all right, I'll see you in the morning. And he would just like go out that night, get all these fish, bring them back. Or he'd call me and say, Hey, I got 550 pounds. Can you take them? And he'd bring them to me the next day. Uh, he was also a commercial guy. So um, <clears throat> the final year we did it, we got over 2,000 pounds of snakeheads. Wow. Um, in a tournament. In a tournament. Um, granted, there was a lot of people and a lot of bow fishermen. But that was the first year where we had people that were fish that were hook and line bringing them in. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, it was just it, to see that growth happen that fast um, of, A, the, the species and, B, the tournament. But the most encouraging thing was that – uh, there was people from all over the country that came. We had people from Louisiana that came up to fish it. We had people from, you know, all over that that came to fish these tournaments. A couple teams from Tennessee. Um, so it was cool to see the community because all the bow fishing guys were like, "Oh man, there's a fish that we can go get on and just bang them to death all night. Let's do it." You know, so they would come and do it. But what the most encouraging thing was is I remember that. They were talking about how the population was going up and down, and it was very up and down at the time. And I remember U.S. Fish and Wildlife said that they were attributing a huge a, a huge part of the decline in the population was being attributed to bow fishing. And I think now what's happened is the bow fishing is still there. It's just dispersed. So now, whereas you had people bow fishing the Potomac all over the place every day, now you still have them, but a lot of those people are like, oh, man. There's snakeheads closer to home, so I'm gonna go. F- I'm gonna go bow fish them at Delaware. Or I'm gonna bow fish them in Upper Bay. So or let, go, let, yeah. let me let me ask you. Did I hear you say something uh, like the numbers were coming up? I mean, I, you know, you talking about talking about the tournaments. You, you said the last one, the numbers really, really came up as far as you know snakeheads. Let me ask you something. Being that you've been over there, and we've heard some of the controversies about the Potomac numbers up, numbers down, balance. Everybody's going to the movie, sharing popcorn, having a good time. You know, we've heard all them kind of stories. So. I guess where I'm going with that is, you know, you said in the beginning, you know, they were shooting a few fish, and then you just said here the last tournament they just shot a massive amount of fish. So my question to you is, and I, I guess I'm asking for your opinion. We know we know the bow fishermen were, were, were doing really, really good with, with getting some numbers out of there. But now that everybody has moved so much, do you think do, – do you see any kind of increase in numbers like a lot of these other guys are saying in the last couple of years, you know, or, or, so, do, or, do, you think, or do you think that we're, we're, we're in good shape over there provided we just keep doing what we're doing? I think the Potomac is a weird beast. I feel like um, the Potomac has so many different – I almost want to say it's a vast variety of ecosystems, if that makes sense. Um, you have – so with the tournament, for example, the final year that it was done was the – the, the biggest participation number we had. Okay. I don't know. I don't remember what that number is. However, what they were bringing in, they were bringing in more volume per team. They were also, but you can also say, hey, these guys are better at doing this now. B, the size of the fish was bigger. I think that like the record was set at the tournament two years in a row. So we definitely saw bigger fish, meaning a uh, more um, a population that has been more stable. When you start seeing more size uh, and then we were seeing, you know, obviously the hook and line guys were getting them, um, which also shows that there was more experience. There is no question um, that that population in the Potomac expanded and dropped. Why that why that population dropped? Uh, it could be attributed to numerous things. But at the same time, as that dropped, there's other portions of the Potomac where it increased. Exactly. And and so 
I know that there's a lot of natural predation with the blue cats. I, you know, I'll argue all day long and say the biggest invasive species problem they have in the Potomac is the blue catfish. Right. And, I, and I've seen it at night bow fishing, trying to go shoot those things. Where, I mean, they're just in swaths moving across the grass, eating everything. I mean, they are a problem. I think that's the difference between here and there. I mean, you have that blue cat population over there in the Potomac River, which is in addition to the snakeheads. You know, here, we only have the snakeheads. We don't have the blue cats. We don't have that kind of issue. So I think that's why we're seeing what we're seeing and they see what they see. But I guess what I'm, I'm realistically trying to just get out there is that, you know, even though we've seen a decrease in some other areas, we saw big increases in areas where we didn't see them. You know what I mean? So a lot of people that are looking at the figures from Maryland, they see that 336% increase. They have to understand that, you know, we're looking in vast amount of areas as opposed to a small condensed area. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so, so that, figure, that figure is a broad spectrum of the whole river, not just Matter Woman Creek. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, and there's and and I I always say to people because you know people like to have this argument with me is, is I always say there is no one size fits all answer when it comes to a giant puzzle, right. um, you know you can't take the glove of the Matter Woman Creek and put that glove on the hand of Blackwater, right. and. You know, so you're never going to come up with the same answers when you have these ecosystems. I do think in the Potomac, though, I do think, you know, it's being shown now that the numbers are increasing. And I I think that there's a variety of reasons why. I think their food source is depleted for a while, too. Um, You know, there's a lot of things. But what the Potomac, what they've done a really good job of in Potomac fisheries that I think that they've failed in the Upper Bay and they've failed in Blackwater with. In the Potomac, there's been a lot of private um, entities that have put a lot into the fisheries because of how much money is made in bass yeah, tournaments in the I Potomac. Agree. I agree. And I think that that attributes to why some of these populations go down. And when they go down, it's not just snakeheads. It's all the fish in the Potomac, except the blue cats. But the, the population will go down, and you'll see them all kind of rise up together. And I think a lot of that, and you know, and I'm not a biologist by any stretch of the means, but it only seems to make sense that a lot of those things could happen. Um, you know, so... Where I have big concerns now and and is the I, I have serious concerns with the upper bay. I think that the upper bay, the explosion that we're seeing there is unparalleled. I, I've never seen them expand as fast as they have there. I agree. I'm um, glad to hear you say this. And, and you know, I, I've been saying for – I caught a snakehead in the Bush River back in Bush Creek maybe three years ago. Yep. Uh, and it was a small one. And I saw it and I was like, well, this is not good. And – you know, I'd heard of people catching them in certain areas. I had never caught one. So when that happened, I was like, this is a problem because I feel like the upper bay, just like Blackwater, has a lot of areas where they're not going to be inhabited by other other fish, areas you don't see a lot of bass or perch. Yeah. Um, yeah. The only problem is those areas that, that are not going to be inhabited, they're spawning grounds. And this is where my fear with the snakehead is. You know, a lot of people have this this pre this this notion that snakeheads are going to come through and eat everything. I don't think that's what they do. I think the biggest problem is is how they usurp resources from exactly. all of the indigenous species. Exactly. How they could potentially carry sicknesses that other other ones don't have. But the Bush River, I think, is a prime example. There's a lot of areas that aren't fishable. They're hard to get to. Uh, they're spawning areas for many many fish. Those areas have just exploded with snakeheads. Yep. You know, we, I have not seen, you know, I'd never seen in the upper bay that every single bass tournament, pretty much every boat brings snakeheads back. Um, you know, I've been out in Bush Creek before a couple times. You know, there's, and I'm not afraid to say the names of these creeks. I'm not either. I'm not understand protecting it. it so. um, but, you know, Bush Creek, uh, back behind Boat Works, there's t- piles yep. of them. And, you know, you can go and there's no size, but that's the scary thing because that just shows how quickly it happens. So now you see Middle River, for example, every back creek in Middle River is loaded with snakeheads. It's not Mm -hmm. this isn't. And we saw them very, very rarely over the course of the past two years. And this year it was like somebody dropped a bomb out of the sky (laughs) loaded with snakeheads. And there's thousands of them in there. So. My big fear is is the upper bay, especially since there's so many areas of the upper bay that you're not allowed to fish. You know, there's big chunks of the Bush River you're not even allowed in coves because of uh, and gunpowder uh, too. I mean, their own gunpowder. Gun gun all up around Aberdeen. Yep. 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 Yeah, yeah, and you have the same the thing about ground. Yep. So, I have huge concern with that, um, but you know. I'm not going to ever be the kind of person that says, oh, well, they're here to stay, so just ignore it. I- I'm never going to be that person. Me neither. I- and, you know, that's kind of the mentality that a lot of people are taking. 
in this in this region, and that that really bothers me because that's a selfish viewpoint. Um, a lot of people have put a lot of time and resources into some of these areas in the Upper Bay, and they're small guys. You know, Scott Sewell has put a lot into. Uh, he's a, he's a prime example of somebody who's put a lot uh, of with. By having very little resources, has put a lot into that bass fishery in there. He's he's and, he's even come to me out of his own pocket and bought minnows for me to bring up there to dump in his creek because you know I mean he he's he sees some stuff happening there himself you know so yeah and and now we're seeing you know just all over Middle River Bush River uh, Back River uh, up yeah, Bird in the, River uh, have you been up Bird River yeah the Bird River is loaded <laughs> good lord. Uh, all around Joppa Town is loaded. The uh, they're catching them all on the backside of the Susquehanna. They're everywhere. They're all over the Elk River. Um, Sassafras is yeah. loaded with them. Bohemian. Sassafras, the first place I heard of them being caught in the Upper Bay, and now they're just they're just everywhere. But even more troubling beyond that, and you know, we can all have the debate about whether this is good or bad. And I, I'm not. I'm. I took a stand like two years ago. Everybody knows my my opinion at this point, and it's not going to change. You know, so it, my opinion will change when science changes, and the science right now has not changed, and the science is what influences me. Um, but what's very troubling and what no one can argue, because everybody sees how the fish expand and populate, what bothers me is the people who put them into these landlocked impoundments, and that is going to be a horrific problem. <laughs> Yeah, um, they're catch they're catching them in in Lock Raven now. They've caught them in Liberty. They've caught them in Piney Run. Um, you know, and there's been videos that Kaz, I know you've seen too. There's been people putting videos on social media for years, like it's a joke throwing these fish into into Liberty. Landlocked these all of these tidal tributaries and estuaries. These fish have places to go. They can leave. They can expand. They can get out. When they get into these small ponds, it is a huge problem. Because they're they're just going to populate, kill everything in the pond. They're gonna and they're not gonna kill it by eating it. They're just gonna co- deplete all of the resources, and the resources are very very limited in non-tidal areas in comparison to tidal. They destroy all the resources, and they're gonna populate. And now not only do we have no population of other fish, we've also got an unhealthy population of snakeheads because they won't they their bio load will be too much for these ponds and landlocked impoundments to support right and we're we we've seen that happen i mean you could go to the old bumpy oak road pond that happened yep. they drained the whole damn pond because there was nothing in it but dying stinkheads um you know so i i think that that's a bigger has a bigger potential threat right now and that's all because of stupid humans like humans being stupid people being dumb and doing things for their own benefit or doing things for trolling shock factor on the internet. Right. And that's where I have a big concern now because like we don't want to see snakeheads taking like being all over the place in Lock Raven. You might want to see it as a fisherman, but we I, I don't think anybody should want to see it as somebody with an environmental concern. Yeah, anybody anybody who's responsible to as a steward of the environment, they they know they know they should not be transporting these fish plain and simple. So no, they do it anyway. That, that's exactly right. They they do it anyway and that's it's completely wrong. Um, so Chad, we're getting close on time here. Before I let you go though, I got to ask you one more question. We haven't even sure. got You got one more question? I got one more. All thing. right, go ahead. <laughs> what is your favorite recipe? You gave what you were on the show, what, what you, what you cooked on the shows and everything, but you didn't give your, your all time favorite snakehead recipe. So what, what, give us your favorite, your all time, your, your number one go-to for snakehead recipes. All right. So a, I like to smoke it. I smoke everything. I I'm, I'm on uh, team Traeger. So I do a lot of stuff with uh, a lot of fish. I do a lot of social media work for them. Um, so I like to get to experiment with with smoke. Um, there's smoke. Anybody who knows anything about you know my my food and over the years, I like to put smoke where it doesn't belong. Um, you know, especially like blowing it up Cass's ass. Um, <laughs> but uh, I like to put smoke in, in in different aspects of things instead of protein. Um, so on, honestly, my, my favorite thing I've ever done with, with snakehead is, is still the, uh, the snakehead cakes I used to make. There were like a Southwest. They were I, delicious, I took man. The, oh. Yeah. I kind of took like the coddy thing where it's like potato and cod. Um, but what I would do is I'd smoke the snakehead. Uh, I'd mix it with, uh, this, uh, this like, kind of Southwest aioli that I used to make instead of doing a regular crab cake style. Uh, then we did a, uh, a spicy mashed potato, uh, black beans and corn, roasted corn, uh, and, and made those into cakes. And then I had a spicy fry flour and we would pan sear it. And I would do them with uh, roasted corn salsa, chipotle aioli, and uh, avocado dill sauce. I'm starving those, right now, yeah. man. <laughs> I know they were, they were awesome because like they were not too in your face. They had a lot of balance going on. Um, I could sell them for a very reasonable price. And those were the ones that to me, 
that's when all of a sudden it got crazy and I was to the point when the city paper put that as like one of the best dishes for that Baltimore thing that year and the Baltimore Sun did that, it was dumb. It was like all of a sudden I'm calling like every day in prep. We're like, all right, I need you to smoke 14 snakeheads. Jesus. You know, for, and, and, it, and we had a we had a theater across from that restaurant that sat 2,000 people. So everybody wanted it. And it was just like it was crazy. There were days where I couldn't get it for a week. And it would just wow. be off the menu because I couldn't get the fish, mm. you know. So um, those are the ones that I think that did the best uh, besides that taco was mm. good. But that's my that was my favorite thing. I just thought it was really good. It had a lot of flavor. It was approachable. It had all of the things that I wanted it to have. Um, I do want to say, though, part of the reason that I backed away and I haven't been doing as much with it over the past couple of years, man, is like there was so much crud ball stuff that surrounds this fishery that – it got to a point with me where kind of my passion project turned into something that bothered me a lot. Um, you know, I started seeing a lot of negativity, a lot of people doing horrible things. You know, I had people that were like calling me saying, Hey, I've got, um, I've got snakeheads. I'm throwing them in a pond behind my house. If you want to buy them from me, let me know. I can get them to you the next day. Wow. Yeah. You know, I have a lot of that stuff was going on and I started to feel like I don't want to be a part of, of, this is the opposite of what we wanted when yeah, we started. You, you don't want to be per- and, perpetuating the problem any, any more than it already is. Yeah, and and I don't think selling them perpetuates the problem. I don't want to. Right. I don't want to put it into that light, but I wanted to distance myself for a minute because the main person that I would buy snakeheads from got out of the business, and he was the person that I trusted, and I didn't trust anybody anymore. I was like, you know, I don't want to buy these fish from some guy and then find out that he's been keeping them in tanks in his basement. You know, and and there was there's a lot of that stuff goes on, and you know I didn't want to get into that, and now I have a lot of sources and people I know and trust that commercially and legally can sell them to me, and now it it just it never took off like I wanted it to, and it looked like it was going to explode at any minute. It just never did, you know, and then all of a sudden the amount of money I, I feel like money really corrupted that whole mentality, and and you know on top of it as well, if you love what you do. You, you know, you love going to work and I, that's why I put my whole ideal and thought process of snakeheads and invasive species into the food that I've always cooked. But there's another side to that coin too, is where when work, when, uh, when you, what you love becomes work, now everything's work, you know, and I want every day to be, when I go fishing, I want to go fishing and I want to love cooking snakeheads at home. I want to love sharing it with other people. But, you know, at the end of the day, cooking is what I do for a living and feeding people is what I love to do. And it just so happens that I'm able to feed people snakeheads, which makes that even better. <laughs> All right. So, Kaz, one more for you or anything? Nope. I think you got me. Um, yeah, one more. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if you only could pick one lure to catch a snakehead with, what would it be? Oh, good God, man. So, are we talking about no, one lure? One lure. Period. One lore that I'm going to catch the most with or one that I'd rather catch one on? Your favorite. My favorite to catch the live target rat, man, or live target field I mouse. I knew you were going to say that. It's I been know. the most productive for me. But my most confident one that I've caught the most on has always been I use a chatterbait with a black black blade, uh, the green pumpkin and brown skirt. And I use as a trailer, I use a the Yamamoto creature, except for I cut, the, I cut it in half. So it's smaller, smaller, the better is That's the exactly other advice right. I give to everyone. People like to try mm. to throw big baits, big snakeheads, like smaller baits, I downsize, agree. downsize, downsize. I agree. And guys laugh at me when I'm throwing an eight ounce chatter bait <laughs> all day. The one I, yep, all day. That's what you do, man. And if you got a trailer, if you want a trailer on it, cut your trailer in half. That's right. Yeah. And like, it works. Like and even, even a swim bait, cut it in half and throw a swim bait trailer or a fluke. Cut the fluke in half and put it on the chatter bait. Trim your skirt down. Well, I appreciate that, Chad. I think I think that about wraps it up for us. We appreciate you having you on, man. You you did a great job for us today. I love you, man. I love you guys, man. Hopefully, mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to the spring rolling around, some better weather, and then uh, we can go rain some hell from above on all of them. And stay mm-hmm. tuned for the Chad Wells recipe book tour coming to Baltimore and all around the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, we'll be doing it, buddy. That's right. We'll be doing it. All right, I really appreciate you guys having me today. Thank you oh, so great. much. We'll see Absolutely, you the show. Man. All right, Chad. It. Take her easy, babe. All right. You so guys have a good one. Everybody, for Gary Smith, Kaz Kenny, myself, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.